My name is Kevin Anikowski, and this episode is going to be on how we think. This episode was more difficult to make compared to the others, so it might be a little bit more jumpy, just to forewarn you. There are some really exciting discoveries and theories on how we think, but first I ask about how we think. Are we just a conglomeration of neural impulses, or is there something more to the mind? If you answered a little bit of both, then you would probably agree with dualism, a philosophical approach that states our mind is more than just our brain. Dualism is the nature of the mind-body problem that you've probably heard of before. But philosophy isn't much on the MCAT, so let's move on away from dualism and the mind-body problem. Maybe we think in terms of game theory. I mean, life is just a big game, am I right? Game theory involves rather cut and dry strategies using moves. For the most part, your moves are to cooperate or defect, but other moves you can use is altruism or spite. Spite would involve harming another, but no gain to the person doing the harm. But these moves complicate game theory. Often we think of two main players, the hawk and the dove. Making a move always costs energy, and the hawk always fights, or acts selfish, they never cooperate whereas the dove attempts to cooperate every time. Thus, a hawk can win in a world full of doves because the doves won't fight back. But in a world full of hawks, the damage from the fights would cause the hawks to actually be selected out. Thus, you reach an equilibrium between the hawks and the doves. Because they don't completely get selected out, they are what's called evolutionary stable strategies. A key dilemma in game theory is the prisoner's dilemma. If you and your partner in crime... Not, not your sexual partner in crime, go to jail, they might ask you to rat out the other. If both of you hold your tongue, you might get, say, one month in jail. Not a big deal. If both of you rat the other out, then you might get three months in jail. But here's the catch. If you rat out them and they cooperate, they go to jail for a year and you get set free. Thus, we have the prisoner's dilemma. If the other person is going to cooperate, it makes sense for us to defect. If the other person defects, it also makes sense for us to defect. But if neither of us defect, our combined sentence is relatively minimal. Well, in an attempt to understand the perfect algorithm for this cooperation and defect strategy, a contest was made, and one strategy came out on top. After countless rounds, which took a total of five nanoseconds, I'm just kidding, I don't know how long it took, the one strategy that won was super simple, called tit for tat. Can you guess its strategy? It's simple, like I said. You first cooperate, then every consecutive move, you just do what the other opponent did. A form of reciprocal altruism. You do me right, I'll do you right. But if you do me wrong, I'll give it right back. And that's it for game theory. Now let's hit another idea. The one that all humans are natural-born scientists. Basically, George Kelly's personal construct theory. Personal construct theory states that we are all people with constructs of the world, like schemas. And we use these constructs to understand and explain everything around us, just as scientists would do. Kelly, considered the first cognitive theorist, also coined the psychological term fundamental postulate. The postulate is simple. We make decisions based on past events. If we know the past, we can predict the future. This would inevitably lend itself to making decisions based on what we recognize from our personal constructs. Do you know what we call this? Well, obviously, recognition prime decision model, coined decades later when a psychologist determined army officers and firefighter chiefs would make decisions based on what they recognized and not weigh out the alternatives. Thus, it's the nature of the recognition prime decision-making model making decisions on what you recognize. Even though anchoring effect is usually for more immediate decisions, it may be used here. If we create a construct, it becomes an anchor for later comparisons. For example, a price tag says, usually $80, but only $40 this week. So you throw down the flowers that you are about to buy, and you snag the Grand Theft Auto game thinking, hell, this is half off. But in reality, it was just an anchor. Around the time that personal construct theory was developed by Kelly in the 50s, the predominant view was psychoanalysis. Of course, you're probably making connections between Freud, sexual motives, other drives, etc. However, I want to address a specific facet of psychoanalysis here, object relations theory. 
Object relations theory argues that we develop and grow attitudes based on our relations with objects in our childhood. Well, what objects? Like toys? Like people? Well, there are both internal and external objects. Internal objects are our mental image of these objects, like the representation of your mother. On the other hand, the external objects are what you would expect, the actual person, something external to you. So the relationship we hold with the internal and external objects will form our relationships and attitudes later on in life. Attitudes like what? How about gender roles or how one ought to act or other attitudes like the sort? Now, this object relations theory is somewhat similar to the cognitive learning theory called social cognitive theory. Social cognitive theory argues that we learn about the world from observing others, whereas object relations theory goes beyond the observation and includes the relationship with each of these things, thus the relation part of object relations theory. So there are two ideas of how we are forming our attitudes. And remember that attitudes are really important. They can function as influences for our values, dissonance, ego, etc. What theory does this sound like? Think functions, attitudes. How about functional attitudes theory? Thus, attitudes function to affect other aspects of your psyche. Functional attitudes theory is straightforward. What other theory of attitude is out there that you should know? I'll give you a hint. Think about your ABCs. The ABC model of attitudes, of course. The ABC model stands for affective component, basically your feelings about something. The behavioral component, Basically, your feelings affect your behavior. And lastly, the cognitive opponent. Basically, just your beliefs. So the ABC model is your feelings of something affecting the behavior which affects how you think. However, these components may not always be consistent. For instance, say you absolutely hate smoking. Detest the idea. Detest people that do it, thinking they're vile, repulsive. Then, one comes up to you on the street and asks for direction after they just smoked a cigarette. And you help them out, even though you thought to yourself, I would never help such people. Here is an incongruency which research supports. I don't particularly like the hodgepodge approach to giving you information, but that's how it's going to be for the rest of the episode. We will go in order of what I would say is the most interesting. First is the modular view of the mind. Have you ever thought of the mind as having discrete systems to understand phenomena, like language or decision-making? Odds are you have. Your argument that the mind has specific areas for certain activities, like Chomsky's language acquisition device. Maybe these areas have to compete with each other. For instance, do you remember what happens in the Stroop effect? The Stroop effect is the phenomenon where you state a color of a word slower if the word is another color, You've probably taken this test before, and it's really difficult. So the question is, are color and word recognition in the same module competing for mental energy, or are they in different models competing for your attention? It's a good question. I don't know. Next, I have a question for you. Do you want power? Do you thirst for power? Well, if so, I recommend the 48 Laws of Power book. Really great book. But I'm trying to allude to Nietzsche's will to power theory. Nietzsche argued that we all have an instinctual drive to be as powerful as we can in our own little niche so that we may achieve the maximum feeling of power. So inevitably, we need to overpower others. Thus, we make deliberate decisions and behaviors to acquire maximum power in our specific area of life. What theory does deliberate planned behaviors sound like? Well, I'm guessing that you're thinking about Icek Ashen's theory of planned behavior. The theory of planned behavior argues we think we have behavioral control. The theory of planned behavior was created after an experiment showed that behavior wasn't 100% voluntary. Originally, Ashen and another psychologist made a theory saying you can predict nearly any behavior if you know its intention. However, it had to be reformulated later from this experiment to take into account that people change their behavior based off of their beliefs. So now, to predict a behavior, we must take into account beliefs, like norms, attitudes, and perceived control. So a theory of planned behavior takes beliefs into account. How much does beliefs and thoughts of death play a role in this? 
Well, it turns out it can play a larger role than you'd think. There was an experiment looking at judges prosecuting prostitutes, and it was found that when asked questions about their death beforehand, compared to simple control questions, judges would sentence extremely high bonds for the prostitutes. The idea that our thoughts are dictated in some way by thinking about our death is called terror management theory. These judges, when they began to think of fear and death, demanded the fullest punishments from a belief system they trust, the judicial system. They fell back into the system in the face of death. But what else might we fear? How about the fear of fear itself? Now that's a phobia, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I want to talk about the fear of losing freedom. All you listening while driving, don't speed. It's bad. Are you speeding? Ha! I bet you are. If so, then you're a prime example of reactance theory. Simply, we react to a restriction of freedom by doing what was restricted, just to show ourselves that we have the freedom that people were trying to restrict. The greater the restriction, the greater the reaction. This is reactance theory. Lastly, for this How We Think episode, which has divulged on numerous other paths and terms, is theory of mind. Theory of mind is the ability to understand and accept that others may have different opinions than you, and you're able to reflect on contents of not just your thoughts, but others' thoughts as well. I like to think of it as theory of mind is when you get into their mind. Theory of mind, their mind. So what term is the opposite of this? Egoism, exactly, which is discussed in another episode. Theory of mind is known to be lacking in certain disorders like autism, for instance. And that's the end of the episode.